Yeah. Hmm. I don't think those would be fast cars. Not if we're in traffic. That would be the slow cars. I don't know how to fix those. So I'm going to talk, though, a little bit about how we can apply streaming data, fast data, big data, to fast cars. Uh, in particular, some examples from Formula One, but also some more general examples. You can catch me by a number of different ways. I work for MAPR, Chief Application Architect. I work with a lot of projects at Apache. I'm currently Chief Appli or no, I'm sorry, VP of Incubator at Apache. That's a temporary role. And you can find buzzwords. Is that blinking? Hmm. I also have email addresses that you can use. Uh, so today, what I want to talk about is what's the point of big data in motorsports? What, what can it help with? How we can play with it, too, with, without buying a Formula One car? Uh, some people I know who have small race cars, and these sort of solutions will help them. I'm also going to talk about a particular general technique of building random data, which is as good as it needs to be in a particularly appropriate way. Every time I look away, it blinks. Every time I look at it, it doesn't. Uh, I'm not sure how we simulate that. Uh, hopefully, it will get better. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how the particular simulation in this case works. We'll see if that helps. So in Formula One sports right now, uh, it's pretty famous that they use data, at least fast data, it made no difference at all. Uh, they use fast data to, to uh, improve their operations, to improve their ability to perform in a number of ways. Often what you'll see are these kinds of diagrams. These are many of the car parameters that are sampled in real time. In fact, normally there are about 300 data sources, data streams that sample. I can't tell if I'm improving it or not. The top line, when you can see it, is the RPM of the engine. You can see during fast straightaways, that's fairly constant. When it's decelerating, it's downshifting very fast. Uh, it's difficult to see here, but uh, some of the downshifts, very difficult to see. Uh, you'll have to trust me. The second line, the blue line, which is completely now no longer intermediate, the second line is the speed of the car. Is there any help here that somebody could get on this? So, uh, okay. There's another alternative. No. So we'll try again. The blue line is the speed of the car. This will appear in a moment. Everybody hold their breath. I think it's upstream. So we're going to continue. The blue line, then, is the speed of the car. You can see it accelerating in the straightaways. You can see it decelerating in, in going into curves. The gear shift shifts down. So this car was so fast that it shifts that within 60 meters, as the car decelerates from over 200 kilometers an hour to about 100 kilometers an hour, and still only goes 60 meters down the road, it shifts down seven times, which is amazingly fast. Uh, more, most important in one of these sorts of uh, measurements, these graphs, are some of the bottom ones, which show the throttle in the golden color. Come on, come on. I will start talking about that in a moment. Uh, this is the throttle here. You can see that they have it maximum, most of the time minimum, sometimes a little bit intermediate, and the bottom is the brake. And then they overlay these. So very often you might, this x-axis is distance, not time, distance around the track. So when you overlay them, you can see how two different cars 
negotiated the track differently. The blue one was able to maintain considerably more speed going into the curve, switch from decelerating to accelerating much more quickly, and over the entire graph, much wider than this, they gained about 1.6 seconds in a single lap. In the controls, you can see the red car started braking much more quickly, the blue car braked much more vigorously and quickly, and then was able to shift back into the higher gears more quickly by using kinetic energy recovery. So there's a lot of visual, sort of visualization sorts of intuitions that people have been getting for about 10 or 15 years from these things. But nowadays, they're going much further. They're doing predictive analysis uh, based on the track temperature, the outside temperature, how the person is taking the track, what will be the tire temperatures. Uh, they normally run the tires at 75 to 90 degrees Celsius, very, very hot. But if they go just a few degrees hotter, the, the tires start ablating more quickly. And depending on how hard they break into the corners, they can predict how high the temperatures will be coming out of there and how quickly they'll go back down. That then drives how quickly the tires wear out, how quickly the tires wear out, how much drag they have in the corners due to slippage or the use of the aerodynamics will drive how much fuel they use. They also then can uh, show how those changing weights will affect the car and the driver. Different drivers have different skills at different times. As the tires wear down, the car gets slower. As the gas becomes lighter, then the car gets faster. So there's a lot of that. They also do game theoretic uh, alternatives because when they pit stop against when the other people take pit stops, that will put new tires on, new fuel, make the car slower, faster against the other people in the race. It'll also, there's very few overtakings except for pit stops. And then they do Monte Carlo analysis against possible weather during the 90 minute race. It's very complex programming. They want to be able to do this on large scale computers back at the factory. They can't do this in the computational systems they have in the pit. So they need to be able to move the data back. And then of course they want to look at this in a larger sense across multiple races. How are they gonna be improving the chances of different drivers on the team? So the outputs then are tactical decisions, what are the probable outcomes, and so on. There's also a lot of value in marketing because Grand Prix, Formula One fans tend to be gearheads and data freaks. So they just love these animated uh, representations of races and things like that, which are of course all driven by data. And the more data, the better. Now you also get people leaking information. This, for instance, is based, I just plotted it this morning. If you go to these bitlies over here, uh, you can find that this person did screenshots and character recognition in real time during the race, the, the Australian Grand Prix, and pulled data out of those and managed to get the position, velocity, uh, throttle settings, and everything during the entire race for one car driver. This is crazy. Uh, and you know, you get occasional little inputs like this, but it just it isn't really gonna work. It's not gonna help us outside the very small community to build interesting software. It, it's, there's gonna be no data that's consistent, no data that's gonna be high enough quality, no data that's, that's going to be usable except in very special cases. You'll be able to make one plot from one race for one driver sometimes. You can't really do fun, interesting work when data is so intermittent and so highly variable. So this highlights a problem that we have in trying to build something interesting, distributable, interesting more than trying to sell to one customer. And that is real data has real problems. Real data is something we can't share typically. If we do get it, then we're gonna be contractually bound to not share it with anybody else. We can't usually even get it. Even when we're partnering with the people who generate the data, they have obligations to the people who are actually having the equipment being measured, so they can't even release it to us, and we certainly can't release it to somebody else. 
we can't break it. I mean, the interesting thing about data like this is what happens if, and that if, of course, is a non-starter. We aren't allowed to have 10 cars crash and watch what happens with the data. We're not allowed to have the real systems go down and see how the failure tolerance handles all of that. None of this really can be done. And that would be the fun stuff, you know, break it. Well, it's one thing if it runs, it's much more interesting if it doesn't. And also there's this continual problem with real data is it comes from the real world and we're not in charge. That means that whatever is happening there, we don't necessarily know except via the data. And so we can't really tell if we're seeing the phenomena in the data that are real. Whereas if we were to make the data, if we controlled the world, we would be able to inject true phenomena that we really knew and then watch how it burbles through the system. We'd be able to see that. So real data has real problems there and fake data would have some very nice properties that we might like to take advantage of. It can be built at any scale. We can build it to be as odd or as normal as possible. We can build it uh, with true knowledge of the state of the universe. And we can build it with arbitrary fidelity. Now, this, this idea of arbitrary fidelity is not that it will match exactly the mechanisms, the, the exact form of the data. But instead, this is a, uh, a thing we've been doing recently with customers, is what we do is build KPI-preserving data generators. The idea is here we have live data, real data. We have a security boundary which hides all of the data and all of the real mechanisms away from anybody's useful observation. So we have live data going into some system under test, and we have key performance indicators or failure modes that we can observe in the system. If it's a machine learning system, then those are like false positive ratios or their uh, score distributions, whatever we care about in the data. If it's going to be cars and such, it's going to be speeds are in the range that's reasonable, accelerations look reasonable, data is going to be coming in at a plausible rate, and so on. So whatever we care most about the system, according to the task that we're setting to ourselves, will be replicated in the data. If we're designing a system and trying to prove that it will handle volumes, then volumes are the key thing. If we're trying to prove that we can resolve certain frequencies of input, then speed of sampling and insertion of those kinds of things are the key. But then if all we do is we take fake data, put it into the same system, and make it so that the failure signatures and the KPIs match, the data itself here could be very, very different. And furthermore, we can just transport the seed and the schema of that randomly generated data out of the security boundary. That's easy to do because it's easy to convince somebody that within one kilobyte of data that's inspectable, we could not have compromised millions of data points, millions of people's data, or hours of machine data. So this is a relatively easy thing to do, getting this live data out is essentially impossible. But once we get the generator for this fake data out, we can generate new fake data and have some confidence that if we put it into similar systems as are running in here, possibly with innovations and novelties, that it will produce similar results. When we find good candidates, things that appear to work better than the live system, we can bring that new system under test inside the security boundary and verify that live data and fake data work the same. To the extent they don't, we can modify the generator again to produce more and more fidelitous data under any scenarios that we like. This is a technique for generating data that has far fewer, far more degrees of freedom, excuse me, far fewer parameters that we need to match, and therefore it's a much, much easier technique than actually matching the exact distribution. It's also more secure in many cases. We may not, in certain circumstances, even need to match the dimensionality of the original input 
in order to get useful simulations. The fundamental idea here is that if it breaks the same, if those failure indicators, if the KPIs match, it's as good as the original. If it weren't true that there's some important difference, then fine, we'll just make a self-fulfilling prophecy. We will add that important difference into the KPIs, and we will tune again to match. So by a circular argument, data that matches this way matches in every important way. So let's do that. All we need to do is pick some reasonable and plausible KPIs. In this sort of thing, we need sample data. We need rates and volumes to be about right. We need the number of samples to be realistic. We need the complexity of the samples to be realistic. We need somewhat plausible physics. You know, the car can't go from zero to 500 kilometers per hour in three seconds. We have to have reasonable accelerations so that we get decent visualizations. We need to have plausible data semantics. It should roughly look like the real data so that it compresses the same way, can be understood by humans looking at it the same way. And of course, as always with cars, your mileage may vary. We may have other KPIs that you'd like that would change your way of doing this. But we're going to build an emulation that roughly, with very whole lot of hand waving, matches the physics of the situation, matches the physics of the cars. And we're going to turn that data spec into KPIs, and then we're going to match by tuning that data spec until we get a decent way of generating data. So it turns out this is pretty easy to do, pretty easy to build realistic things. Now, the real system is complex. This is the real system that we might be designing. There's an RF link. The cars are out there on the track spinning around. They transmit data via an RF link. They have about 12 megabits per second that come in here. The data first goes to the FIA, the, the referee's pit. It needs to be caught there first in a secure data set. Then it'll be distributed to each team. I've only drawn one team. What happens there is local analytics. We need to do replication to an engineering workstation so that if somebody has a laptop or something, data can be streamed into that and persisted there. So when they disconnect and go to a hotel that night, they have access to a full history. We also need to be streaming back to the factory to be doing all of those Monte Carlo and strategic simulations back there. And of course, archiving it, hopefully something like Apache drill to be analyzed offline. The particular implementation that we're going to use here today uses MAMPAR streams for that, but at these low data rates that we're demonstrating, Kafka would work just fine. The particular demo we're going to use here is considerably simplified because it's supposed to run in just a few VMs. It's going to have a physics-based, pseudo-physics-based simulator there. It's going to be generating engine and performance criterion there based on emulation of a robot-driven race. I'm going to drive that into streams out to uh, a simple interface built on Bootstrap and D3 for visualization, Jetty for a REST interface to data, and of course, archive into a database and access the data via drill. I think the part we're going to demo today is just this upper channel to show it generating data and accessing it. Makes sense? The hard part is this idea of KPI matching. Uh, you'll see how some of the KPIs are things that we're not yet matching. The, the key generator here that we're going to use and that we're going to tune to produce the data we need and data volumes that we need is something called Torx, which is extensively used in research, largely, ironically, in AI. You'd think it was used in video games when it produces things like that. But the idea is that a quasi-physical situation like that, where you have opponents who are doing actual physical things, and you're trying to overtake them, and they're trying to keep you from overtaking them, is a very interesting domain to work in. And having a simulator to do that gives everybody access to a common ground for, for competing in building these artificially intelligent drivers. You can also, of course, control these manually. 
but the primary use lately over the last five or so years for Torx is actually in building automated systems. There's a, an ongoing Grand Prix of, of robots that compete in various kinds of races, various kinds of absurd situations that they're subjected to. So we use Torx and tune its inputs to produce quasi-realistic outputs. And we would like to prove out that the particular task here is prove out software architectures, test certain software uh, architectures for building data pipelines and for pushing data through all of those replicas. Uh, we also want to tune UIs to match the customer expectations. Not actually to play video games. No, no. Instead, what we're going to be doing is simulating a production system and especially failure scenarios in order to prove to the customers that the systems downstream of the, the RF link can handle things in adverse circumstances. And we want to see, supposing that the cars produce 10 times as much volume that they, than they do today, could we build a system that handles that as well? So the current status, it works in a limited fashion. Uh, it's available on GitHub, or at least it will be available shortly on GitHub. It's on GitHub just hasn't been turned to public yet. All of the systems you'll see here today are, are available. The idea is that it's built with one VM for the physics simulator, pushing data out to a data collection VM. Those both run in fairly small instances, so you're not going to see huge performance out of them. You can replicate either one onto more capable hardware and get much more uh, capable results. Now, we don't currently simulate enough of the parameters to get the data volumes that would be normally required in a production setting. Notably things like tire temperature times four at least, multiple brakes uh, disks and things like that are not simulated. The 300 or so data sensors in the car which are sampled in rates from once every 10 seconds to 10,000 times per second are here represented because of the limits of this simulator by samples 50 times per second against four, six, or eight parameters. But this will be enhanced over time as we go forward. The data rate is currently also fixed. The real data rate changes over time. As the car goes into corners, for instance, in a real Formula One car, the data rate spikes right there because a lot of stuff is changing. In a straightaway, the data rate drops a lot because things change much less quickly. Uh, the data is currently collected in pure JSON, but in practice it would be collected in the, in the RF link, through the RF link even, in a columnar compressed form. If you think about it, data is commonly thought of in rows, but if you store it as columns, here are kind of JSON versions of those. If you store it in columns, then each of these arrays, which represent a single column, have the same kind of data from a same kind of distribution. If, for instance, column C1 is timestamps, they're going to step forward by relatively constant amounts, and so they're subject to a lot of compression. You can stick one of these columnar subtables in as a single value if you have sufficiently general data structures. And so in a message stream, you could have messages coming along in time that actually have small blobs in them, which are columnar data structures themselves. Those are subject to lots of compression and are a very efficient standard way of storing time series data. Here's an example of how much compression you can get. We took 64-bit time samples, time stamps. We have differing amounts of jitter on a 100 microsecond intersample period. And if the jitter is small, the compressed size becomes very, very small. Even with five microseconds out of 100 jitter, you get 10 to 1 compression of those timestamps using very simple, I can't quite read it, but basically the idea here is you XOR adjacent samples, and then you do binary packing of the residuals. The residuals are mostly zeros because very few bits change. This is a very common technique. It's even more general than delta sampling. 
and other data, the actual samples, will also compress comparably in many cases. Now, another thing to keep in mind is we want to have something that has the power of JSON in terms of flexibility. Here's a sample piece of data that only has three sensors, for instance. We'd like to be able to extend it fairly transparently, adding another or one or two data samples and have the queries on new and old data work transparently across all of that. That's one of the key advantages for using something like Drill. So I'm going to ask Tug to come on up. He's got the simulation running on his machine. We'll see if we can plug it in and show how it looks. Uh, if Murphy is, is happy with us, that is. This is live demo after all. It's right here. Okay, do you want uh, the noisemaker or you want me to talk? He wants me to talk. I will translate. He'll speak English, and I'll translate. So I'll start a race. Here comes a race. <laughs> it starts. Lots of cars. That's a car. You can see multiple cars here. They're jostling for position. And you can see that their speeds are quite comparable as they go along. That's a time axis on the horizontal right now on this visualization, not a distance axis. So we can switch to distance. There we go. Here's the distance measurement. This is for RPMs here. The, the, these cars, you can see jags in the speed curve. Those are typically caused by shifting anomalies. <laughs> and you can see things shifting as they go along. All of this is controlled automatically by a bot written to plug into the simulator. Oh, here comes a, a drill query. So the data is being archived in a MapRDB table in JSON format, I believe. It's a nested JSON format so that you get a header and then you get arrays of records. This is the row embedded form instead of the column embedded form. But the same idea of flattening would apply to the column embedded form. So what query was that? So the average speed by car and race. So let's take a look at the query again. Can you make that bigger? And so this is a real-time query as things have been collected, right? So there's a subquery in there, which is flattening the data. That makes it look completely uh, relational. It's being pulled out of a, a MapRDB table, but that's the same as the HBase API. That could as well have been an HBase table there. The flattened here takes that array and makes records for every element in the flattened array. And then you get normal uh, SQL syntax above that for computing averages, except for the fact that we have nested values. And we saw the nested values previously in those slides. And Again, that's an extension to SQL that's very useful for these IoT sorts of applications. The race is still going on. Red seems to be doing quite well. Oops, there it is. Finished. Somebody won. OK. So there you go. Uh, any questions? Does anybody have an application like this with real-time data, real-time measurements? Any physics sorts of things happening out there? OK, we're going to start assigning questions. <laughs> so, yes. OK. So it's time for Q&A. Anyone wants to go first? I'm going to victimize people I know first, if you aren't careful. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an entirely related question, but uh, you said there are bots uh, that are controlling these uh, simulators. Uh, has anyone working on, well, there is a lot of hype about uh, self-driving cars. Uh, is anyone building self-driving uh, racing cars? 
these are self-driving racing cars. Uh, if I actually had to build my own racing car and pay for that, I don't think I'd want one of these bots to, to be running it because a lot of times these things are tuned to take chances, particularly. That's how you win sometimes against other bots. But these are very similar to those self-driving cars, except that they get a few extra cues from the race simulator. So for instance, the, uh, in Torx, the center line of the track is given as an input to the bots so that they can tell what the veer off angle is for the center line for where they're going at the given moment. And steering toward that center line is the simplest and quickest bot. You don't do nearly as well as if you do uh, cutting into the apex of corners and things like that. The advanced bots in these simulations uh, and in the follow-ons to Torx actually do neural net learning as they're doing laps. So as the track conditions change or, or as competitors change, they will change how they take each curve in order to learn fast laps. So these are comparable but much, much simpler because the sensory input is simpler. I don't know if anybody's building real race cars. Uh, my guess is that would be a very expensive hobby, at least initially. If you've ever seen the Google cars, especially in the rain, they drive kind of like this. They're very hesitant in any sort of difficult situation. So if cars were passing them like that, they would just kind of back out. That wouldn't be a great race car. And that's because of the cost of the cars, of course, and the cost of the liability. In this sort of situation, it would be very expensive, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other questions? So do they really drive back? Do they really Google drive back? Google cars? What? You said that they are backing up, you know, when someone is passing by. The, do they the, stop I've and just drive back? I've never seen a Google car back up, but I have seen it stop and then move just an inch at a time forward in situations where it can't really see around the corner, rain is on the scanning sensors, and so it's nearly blinded, as a, as a real human would be, but they tend to have a do no harm sort of attitude. One did get a ticket r recently because it was driving too slowly. Uh, and they have matched so far the accident rates of 75 year olds, uh, which is kind of you know cautious driving. But humans assume that the other people are going to be reasonable and take chances with generally good results and generally without surprising the drivers behind them. Sure. There was a question in the middle of the back. Oh. Yeah, he's going to throw you. <laughs> I just translate for you too. So, so the question is, why did we choose JSON instead of Avro or Protobufs or something like that? Well, the, the simplest reason is because it has to go on a slide. Uh, and that looks just a whole lot better on slides. Uh, but uh, a, a more important reason is that this is the first version of this. And so visual debuggability is very important right now. Uh, it, there would be a variety of formats that would be usable going forward. Some are not, because it has to still be a record by record format. So something like Protobuf or Avro would be acceptable as long as we have a schema registry in the case of both of those. Some other formats like uh, Aero might be very useful for the little glob of data. So uh, where we have columnar compressed data, uh, Aero would be a very reasonable candidate for that compressed columns. Uh, <coughs> Once you get to it, any sort of binary form of JSON, OHI, is a, is a very reasonable category there because it's a binary JSON encoding. SBE, simple binary encoding, which is designed by the financial world, would be another one. Uh, given that we started and are using OHI in other areas, we would probably gravitate toward that. Uh, it would be efficient for the binary and compressed encodings, and it would still have JSON semantics, which many of these other things do not have. So that's probably where we'll go. Uh, there's no good reason to use just plain JSON unless data rates are low. And, you know, JSON's pretty fast, but not as fast as a dedicated uh, binary encoding. It's got good physical properties. 
stored in punched cards. Better than punch cards, you say? Yeah, yeah. the fastest. Been there, done that. I hope I don't do it ever again. Hi. Uh, it seems to it seems to me that uh, if you have like 10 or 20 or like 1,000 KPIs, you will have to do millions of uh, simulations before uh, you fit uh, on them correctly. Is this true? Or? So the data rate, the computational load for different KPIs varies a lot. Uh, the data rates already for uh, doing the visualization dwarf the physics-based computations in the, in the current situation. So if we want to make things more efficient and produce lots and lots of KPIs, so for instance, we can pretty easily uh, emulate the tire temperature based on a simple cooling model and a simple energy conversion model due to tire slippage. So we could get tire temperatures, brake temperatures, and, and many other things like that very quickly. And those change very slowly outside of the corners. And so a variable speed integrator on those will have no problems keeping up. The overall engine speed and car speed and acceleration model runs at a 50 hertz integration rate. That's, that's the sampling on that. And it runs a variable step integrator within that. But the total amount of floating point computation is really quite low. So, I don't think that adding another 100 KPIs would be nearly as expensive as simulating the cars and doing the collision detection. And I think it'll be far, far less expensive than rendering the, the visualization of the race itself. So I don't think that should be a problem. But uh, you compress the entire data set in a single random seed. In this case, we compress the entire data set into a single race and car configuration file. We don't constrain the seed even. Uh, we could, and that is good practice. It, it's often true that you can match your KPIs. Suppose I have Gaussian distributions. If I set the seed, I might be able to say, big one close, little one far, another big one far away. If I don't constrain the seeds, I might get distribution over many, many different configurations, and I might not match the KPIs, the specific KPIs I want. So constraining the seed and learning across different seed values might help me match the KPIs in certain situations, and I've certainly seen that. In this one, we have very, very loose KPIs, and so I don't think that that's necessary. I think we do need to add measurements to match the volume and data rate KPIs. But I don't think we need to do much else. OK. Is, How, is this GitHub what is not available publicly right now? It is public. So yes, it is. It's under github.com slash. There it is. It's almost invisible. There it is. More visible. Racing time series. So okay. yeah, clever man. I believe there is a time for one more question. I'm Everyone shocked. is looking around. Surely there's more video game players here than that. They just don't want to admit it, I think. They're already thinking about this chip that they need to collect in single threaded queue. Yeah. <laughs> going the, once, going twice. The data twice. does not necessarily need to be single threaded. That's an interesting point. Uh, it's very common here that you'll have a lot of different delays between different channels. So you've already lost ordering between cars of data. And the ordering of data within a single car versus another car doesn't entirely make sense except at the level of milliseconds, not at the level of microseconds. And so it would be very natural to partition the stream on car. Mm -hmm. So we would already have quite a bit of parallelism there. Uh, and then within certain parameters, you need to maintain lockstep of the sampling, but other slow ones could also be pulled out into different topics. So we wouldn't have single-threaded. I, I was actually talking about this chips distribution that people will be collecting, you know, outside of this room. Yes, just, indeed. Uh, in a I minute, so maybe next time you will parallelize this as well. I plan to multitask on those too. Sure. <laughs> we have two partitions for that, <laughs> each of us. Okay, uh, so we are at the top of the hour. Thank you, Ted. Thank you.